Hi, welcome to Comics Crash Course. It happens over and over again. When something gets really popular with kids, parents freak out. Maybe it's rock and roll, or heavy metal music, or rap music, or role-playing games, or violent video games, or card games, or maybe it's violent movies or violent TV. And it turns out, comics weren't immune. There are about 60 million, that's 60 million, comic books published every month in the United States. But those figures are really quite misleading. In a minute, you'll see why. Ask 10 kids where they got the comic book they're reading. Maybe one or two will tell you they bought it. The rest traded for theirs. They buy one book and they read 10. It's wonderful economics, but unfortunately, it means that 10 times as many kids read books they never should even see. There are no economic or racial lines to the comic book threat. They reach every strata. Kids read them in the North and in the South. Stories like The Human Hyena. Stories like Time to Die. They read them in living rooms in Dubuque and alleys in Manhattan. They read them in tree houses. They read them tucked into their notebooks in classrooms. And at night, they dream about them. One glance is enough to tell you that this boy just got out of school for the day. And why shouldn't he be happy? Until supper time, he can do anything he wants to do. He's free. And he knows exactly how he'll while away the hours. He'll spend a nice, quiet afternoon with a comic book. I think it's important to note here that the comic book wasn't just an anti-boredom measure. He could have played baseball, but he chose the comic book instead. So today, we're talking about the moral panic against comic books in the 1940s and 1950s. This is one of the flashpoints in comics history in the United States. Anti-comic book sentiment began quite early in the medium's history, with articles appearing as early as 1940. The most famous of these early pieces was by Sterling North, whose editorial, A National Disgrace, was published in the Chicago Tribune on May 8, 1940. He claimed comics were harmful to children primarily because they would destroy their ability to appreciate good art. Quote, badly drawn, badly written, and badly printed. A strain on young eyes and young nervous systems. Their crude blacks and reds spoil the children's natural sense of color. When he criticized comic book violence, it was more about taste than gore. He says again, their hypodermic injection of sex and murder make the child impatient with better the quieter stories. The debate raged among educators as well. At the time, no one thought reading comics was great. Everyone wanted their kids reading real books. And while some agreed with North that the only solution was to replace comics in kids' hands with good children's literature, others felt comic books could be used as a first step to real reading, and even praised the efforts of series like Classics Illustrated, which could act as a gateway to classic texts. However, in 1946, the Ayers newspaper directory published its findings on print sales numbers, revealing that comic books were outselling traditional books. The comic books were taking over. <laughs> on top of their popularity, as I discussed in my last video, a lot of publishers were beginning to cater to different audiences and market books with darker and more mature imagery. And in 1948, the anti-comics movement found a figurehead in Frederick Wortham. Wortham was a German-born psychiatrist specializing in child development. He had been working in New York and opened a low-cost mental health clinic in Harlem where he specialized in helping black youth, a particularly underserved community. His writing during this time would eventually be used in the Supreme Court case Brown v. Board of Education. So how does a guy like this become one of comic history's worst villains? Well, Wortham found that many juvenile delinquents he talked to said that they read comic books, and so he felt that there must be a connection between juvenile delinquency and comic book imagery. So starting with an article that he published in Collier's titled Horror in the Nursery, Wortham began publishing regularly. He wrote about how crime comics literally taught children to become criminals, and how violent imagery in crime and horror comics made children violent. While Wortham was far from the first person to make these arguments, he was a celebrated psychiatrist with research to back up his claims. And so his work turned the anti-comic book sentiment that had been bubbling for a while into a full-blown national movement. In fact, at least 16 comic book burnings were held across the United States after 1948. Wortham's research culminated in his famous 1954 book, Seduction of the Innocent. 
He spends most of his time talking about crime in horror comics, like the EC books that we talked about last week. Now, EC books are interesting and smart, but some of the imagery is really shocking. And again, as I mentioned last week, that was on purpose. I think it's worth thinking about some of the covers. Now, I don't think you'd like a six or seven year old to see some of these. And while I'm not sure that violent imagery actually makes people violent, it's interesting that this is a conversation we still have today about violent movies and violent television, and even more about violent video games. Wortham also argued that many popular comics featured subtle and not so subtle sexual imagery that was problematic for kids with developing minds and bodies. Now, he seemed to think that exposure to these images would lead to so-called sexual deviancy, which meant everything from homosexuality to an overactive sex drive. I don't agree with him about the deviancy, either that images can cause it or that homosexuality is something to be concerned about. But he's not wrong that there were and are problems with the representations of women in comics, especially when it comes to sexual violence. So in addition to these more understandable controversies, Wortham also opposed superhero comics. For example, he thought Superman's might makes right philosophy was fascist. Here's a quote from the book. Superman needs an endless stream of ever new submen, criminals and foreign looking people, not only to justify his existence, but even to make it possible. It is this feature that engenders in children either one or the other of two attitudes. Either they fantasy themselves as supermen with the attendant prejudices against the submen, or it makes them submissive and receptive to the blandishments of the strong men who will solve all of their social problems for them by force. He thought Batman and Robin modeled a homosexual relationship, claiming, quote, only someone ignorant of the fundamentals of psychiatry and psychopathology of sex can fail to realize the subtle atmosphere of homoeroticism which pervades the adventures of the mature Batman and his younger friend Robin. And Wonder Woman? Well, she was, quote, the lesbian counterpart of Batman, he said, in no small part because her comics apparently showed an, quote, extremely sadistic hatred of all males in a framework which is plainly lesbian. As I've been reading his words, I've been showing pictures that might be construed as backing up his points, but I bet a lot of you were also laughing when I read those quotes and looking at those pictures. It's true that Superman uses force, and that for years people have performed queer readings of characters like Batman and Wonder Woman. But superheroes are complex symbols and capable of many readings. Superman, for example, was also frequently used as a symbol of American patriotic propaganda during the war, so it's kind of strange to hear Wortham trying to paint him as a Nazi. Superheroes can't mean one thing, and to claim that not only do they mean one thing, but that they cause children to act on that one thing seems a little intense. But I've included this evidence to inject a little balance to the discussion of Wortham's ideas. He's often portrayed as the mustache-twirling supervillain in comics history, but I think there are ways in which his ideas aren't so foreign from conversations that we still have today. Nor was he totally making stuff up there are absolutely queer subtexts in Batman. And forget subtext, Wonder Woman is practically a queer text. My response just happens to be, so what? Unfortunately, the average parent in 1954 probably had a different response. And regarding violent imagery, I think the question gets more complicated. Can images shock, harm, or frighten young people? If so, how can we protect them from images they shouldn't see? And whose job is it to decide? Should those images be banned? Who gets to draw those lines and for what reasons? These are really complicated questions our society still struggle with. For me, the biggest issue with Wortham isn't that he struggled with those questions, or even that he came to different conclusions than I would, but that he doctored evidence to do it. Scholar Carol Tilley found that a boy Wortham claimed was inspired to homosexual activity by Batman comics, said he explicitly preferred other comics but did read Batman. Wortham also left out that the boy had himself been a victim of abuse. These are important contextual details to help us understand the young man's situation and his eventual crime, but of course Wortham only wanted to blame Batman comics. He left out that relevant detail to bolster his case, and did it with several other patients. Even more damning is Dr. Chris Pizzino's research regarding Robert Peebles. Seduction of the Innocent's opening anecdote is based on the Peebles case. He was convicted of murder after a bullet from his rooftop target practice hit and killed someone at a nearby baseball game. It sounds straightforward, but the case against Peebles was a setup. The bullet shelves on the roof were the wrong type, the angle and distance of the shot was pretty much impossible. But Peebles was a poor black boy and the victim was a white man. It was the 1950s. And a comic book was found in Peebles' room. 
So in Seduction of the Innocent, Wortham plays up the fact that the unnamed murderer was a comic book reader. But Pacino's research found that Wortham knew how weak the case against Peebles was, and even discussed his likely innocence before the book was published. Wortham also knew that there was just one comic book in the room, just one. He was no compulsive reader. But Wortham used the story anyway. He threw Peebles under the bus to make his point. Shortly after the publication of Seduction of the Innocent, the United States Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency called a hearing dedicated solely to comic books. That's right, the federal government got involved. But we're already going long, so we'll talk about that next time. See you then.